My name is Dr. Robin Boylorn. I am the Kentuck Art Center's Humanity Scholar for this season and Associate Professor in the Department of Communication Studies at the University of Alabama, where my research and writing is primarily um, grounded in social identity and diversity, primarily the lived experiences of Black women in the American South. So I think that one of the reasons it's so important to think about and talk about um, the narratives and histories and lives, interior lives of Black women in the South is because so often those stories get erased. When we think about the South, when we think about the civil rights movement, um, when we think about lynching victims, when we think about, you know, all of those things generally center Black men and Black boys as if Black girls and Black women were immune and they were not. And so I think it's really important that we reimagine um, and re-remember what the actual experiences were of Black women in the South and where they were, right? Because they were always there. There is not a, um, a, a social justice movement that has existed in the last 50 years that is not centered um, and been primarily led by Black women, but they're oftentimes erased. We oftentimes think of them as the, the mothers, the ones who are cooking the food, right? And not the ones who are strategizing. But Black women are multitaskers, so they have always done all of those things, right? I think that patriarchal structures required them to tend to the children, to cook the meal, but then also after the kid was, to, was in bed and the, and the dishes were washed, uh, doing the grunt work as well as the mind work. And we don't think about Black women as intellectuals, but they are. And we don't think about Black women as strategizers, but they've always been, right? So one of the examples that I think about that was really inspiring to me, I wrote a piece about um, the lynching memorial in Montgomery and how it is very intentional about the ways in which it frames Black women as um, not just being involved in the ways that um, lynching activism happened, it happened, but being the anchors of it. So if you go into that memorial, you are first, you, the first thing that you, the first image and the first thing that you see is a mother um, slave with her child reaching out as you're walking in. Um, your entrance, her exit, right? And then to leave the lynching memorial after you've gone through this maze, um, emotional and material and physical, of um, kind of reckoning with the ways that that Black people were murdered to get out. You know, there is the Ida B. Wells, um, an area dedicated to Ida B. Wells, and then who was a famous, probably the most famous um, lynching activist. And then there are unknown Black women at the exit that you have to encounter to leave. And so the ways in which Black women are there and represented not just as the people left behind after a man is lynched, but their names are included and inscribed on those coffins. Um, and their presence is represented, not with, they're, anonym, they're anonymized, right? So we don't know their names, but I think that that speaks to the ways we have to uh, re-remember and memorialize them. We have to um, acknowledge that they were there and um, I think kind of look in, lean into the stories of black women who we don't know, whose names um, and faces are not recognizable. The exhibit, Good Trouble, highlights work of, for example, Lynthia Edwards and that, and her work, um, she has two quilts and, um, and an image that were particularly striking to me as we think about um, these representations of Black women known and unknown, right? So one of, one of her pieces, Civil Disobedience, which features um, Rosa Parks, who is an icon, right? And so Rosa Parks is a really good example of this because she is known for her refusal to sit down um, or to give up her seat on the bus. So Rosa Parks is, is well known for refusing to give up her seat on the bus, but she was not the first person she was not the first black woman to do that. She was perhaps the most respectable, perhaps the most light skinned, right? Um, but her story then, her story gets magnified by the stories of those other black women 
gets erased from memory and from the storyline, right? And so I think it's really important that um, as we as we um, acknowledge and um, affirm the experiences that Rosa Parks had and what she represents, that we also um, think about and pay attention to the stories that we don't know and the women who um, who did it before her but didn't get the reverence, didn't get the accolades, didn't get the, the attention um, or the support. There is another quilt in Edwards's exhibit called Yamami. It's called y Yamami and it features a mammy figure, right? Which is which is a very recognizable trope. Um, oftentimes we think about mammy figures as if that's her name, as if mammy is a, is a name attributed to a black woman, but it's not as a caricature. Mammies were safe black women, right? Who were not dangerous or aggressive or sexy. And so your mammy becomes this archetype for a particular type of black woman and a, and, and a, and a certain type of representation of black woman that in, that in many ways is the antithesis of your Rosa Parks. Um, and in many ways is the antithesis of the women before Rosa Parks who resisted white supremacy. I really like the way that Edwards kind of um, uh, takes back that image to use it in a way to empower black women instead of to dismiss them. We see these, uh, in, in, we see black women in found photographs and, um, and represented through the imagination. You know, there's several, there's several, several images of black women in the exhibit and representations of black women in the exhibit. And for me, they represent some of these, these unknowns, um, these pauses these nameless, unknowable um, women whose lives are interconnected and intertwined in the ways that Black women's lives always are, particularly Black women in the South. It seems to have been a prediction of, of what was to come. You know, we, we are in a moment of racial reckoning um, nationally and globally. And so it's important, I think, to put the larger conversations about race and racism in context, particularly in the South. Oftentimes when we think about, you know, people, people house particular um, experiences and memories of racism and the civil rights movement in the South and in Alabama, and rightfully so, but it oftentimes gets put in kind of a, a time capsule as if that was how, that was what it was like then. And, but that's what it's like now. Right. There there's so many in so many ways we are experiencing a resurgence of the same types of um, restrictions and emboldened racism that was inherent to the lives, the lived experiences of black people in the 60s in the South. Right. We are living that now. And so I think that the exhibit, the exhibit presents itself as both a reminder and a warning, right? It, it, it takes us back, um, takes us back in time. It reminds us of what happened, but it also warns us about what will happen, um, what's happening now and what will happen in the future. There's gonna be um, a repetition of, 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 those, um, of those reckonings if we don't make shifts and changes. There's gonna be, um, you know, the, the legacies and the stories um, some that are that are really specific to Alabama, um, I think, is really important to think about in the context of 2021 Alabama um, voting rights and um, you know um, the prison industrial in, um, complex, the ways in which Black people are just as vulnerable now as they've ever been. Opportunities are just as limited now as they've ever been and what are we gonna do about that and how, and the ways in which artists, um, several of the artists talked about giving voice to giving voice to experiences and giving voice, having voice for people, creating voice um, for the unspoken and for the people who don't have, who amplifying, because you know, I think, I don't think it's necessarily true when we say you're giving voice to someone. It's not that they don't have a voice, it's that they don't have a microphone. Right. So what does it mean to 
amplify the lived experience of people and the experiences of a people through art, um, which gives us really, um, gives us nuanced ways of thinking about it. It's surface, it's history, it's present. Um, it, it predicts, it sustains, it represents, but it also um, implicates, right? So there, there are different ways that this art, that engaging with this art as I did, um, interacting with it in the ways that I was able to, and knowing that these stories were coming forth from black artists, Alabama black artists, means something to me as an Alabama black artist, right? Um, picking up, like, how can I pick up this story and carry it forward? Um, carry it forward. What does it mean? What does this mean to my own work, right? How does this inform my own understanding of this story, this ongoing story? Um, of the civil rights movement, past and present, right? Um, which is which is what the exhibit is called. It's it's a look back, but it's also a look down, a look up, a look around, um, and a look forward. Because it's it's almost baffling to think about the ways about the things that haven't changed, um, or the things that have gone back to a to being a particular way. It's terrifying, but it's also empowering to think about how. Uh, about the, the ways that these Black artists are unapologetically truth-telling. To ask Black people to not remember the racialized slights and, and, and the intergenerational impacts of them is asking them to willfully forget how and why they're dealing with some of the things they're dealing with now that have a direct line back to those things you want them to forget so that so that there's no, you know, um, so that you don't have any choice but to just think that you did, like what, whatever whatever's going wrong with you, you did it. You should have made different choices. The whole bootstraps mentality, right? Which is very interesting to me because not everybody has bootstraps to pull up. And so how do we account for that, right? How do we account for this assumption that, that if people are struggling, it's because they didn't try hard enough, they didn't pray hard enough, they didn't believe, when you have bootstraps and they don't. You have context and they don't. Um, so I think it's dangerous for black people to forget where they came from. But I think it's more dangerous for white people to forget where they came from. And, you know, I think I think oftentimes white people are invested in a particular type of amnesia that doesn't hold them accountable for the ways in which their forebears created structures that have been embedded in and institutionalized in ways that they will always benefit from and people of color will always suffer because of. And so there are ways in which there's just this distortion, this this um, distortion of the truth, a way of, of thinking about history and thinking about things that happened in ways that, that they didn't really happen um, to justify, because it doesn't, that doesn't sound right, does it, right? It doesn't sound right to hear someone say, well, all they wanted was to be treated like a human being. And because if you, you can't characterize that as, as you can't characterize that as unreasonable. Like they just wanted equal pay for equal work. They they just wanted to not be abused to vote. They, so it doesn't sound right for someone to say to say the thing, to say the truth, right? The truth is they just wanted equality. That's all. <laughs> That's all. Um, yet our, our memory of it is very different and the ways in which people remember things is often through the lens of their comfort. And so I think that we have to challenge people to look at things through a lens of discomfort. What makes you uneasy? Remember it that way. Um, re remember it in a way that doesn't help, that, that doesn't allow you to sleep well at night until you fixed it. Because that's what, that's, that's the, that's the work of activists. They, they do the work that they can't because the injustice is so 
prevalent, it's so, it's so deep. They can't rest until they've done everything they can do to make it right, right? And there's a lot of wrongs to make right.